Hello and welcome to lesson three, conformity to social roles. In this lesson, we're going to look at Zimbardo's experiment, his famous Stanford prison experiment, and we're going to do some evaluation of that procedure. You need to take away from this a clear understanding of how and why people conform to social roles and some of the effects that doing so actually has on them. We all conform to social roles to an extent in society. I'm a teacher, I pretend to be a teacher. I mean, obviously I'm a teacher, but you, you know what I mean. I'm conforming to a social role, and to some extent my behaviour is not my own. You're students, and you're conforming to a social role. That uh, dynamic is fairly innocuous. However, what do we get when we get a prisoner and a guard dilemma? We're going to find out. So let's get stuck into a bit of background on the Stanford Prison Experiment. So this was funded by the US Navy because they were interested in the causes of conflict between guards and prisoners within prisons and military compounds. Uh, Philip Zimbardo was interested in testing the dispositional hypothesis. Essentially, at this point in history, the main contending hypothesis was that people in prison are bad guys and therefore they behave badly and the guards have to retaliate in kind. Also it was believed that maybe the types of people who become guards are naturally more sadistic. Uh, sadistic. Um, and Zimbardo suspected that actually some of this uh, violence in prisons was just a result of the situation itself. What he calls situational attribution. In other words, attributing the problem to the situation. In this case, the situation is the prison. So, 1973, the aim of the study is to investigate the effects of being assigned either to the role of a prisoner or a guard in a mock prison. So it's a fake prison. The independent variable, the thing that he's changing, is whether or not you are randomly assigned. Remember, random allocation is something that's really important in labs. Um, you are randomly assigned to either be a prison guard or a prisoner. Videos, direct observation and quantitative uh, data were gathered throughout this um, study and it involved a volunteer sample of 24 males. For the duration of the, studies, uh, the study, the prisoner remained in the mock prison for 24 hours every day um, the participants were not given any information about what to expect or how to behave. Pri prisoners were arrested at their homes by uh, real police officers who were taking part in this. Now, uh, there's a lot more detail that you need to know and that's in your guide notes. But basically, this group of 24 males, they enter Stanford. The entire basement's been turned into a, a prison, quote, prison. And they're assigned the roles. They're given minimal information and just left to run a mark. The findings are again in your guide notes with the specifics, but the experiment demonstrated that both guards and prisoners in the experiment conform to expected social roles. They had certain expectations of how these roles should, you know, people in these roles should behave, and they conform to them. So they identify with them. Remember we talked about identification earlier on. And their behaviour and attitudes changed. So guards, for example, became increasingly aggressive and sadistic. Prisoners became increasingly passive and accepting. Even Zimbardo acted like the prison superintendent. So even he was identifying with the role to some extent. So remember, the guide notes show you that actually the the uh, experiment was called off after just six days, even though it was supposed to go on for two weeks because of ethical concerns. Um, increasingly aggressive behavior on the guard side was the main issue, but the stress being caused to visible stress to the prisoners as well. Remember, these participants were randomly allocated. So there was an equal chance of being either a guard or a prisoner. So Zimbardo explains the outcome of this study and he says that the reasons for the deterioration in guard behaviour, for example, was power. Power corrupts and, and in this case uh, corrupted absolutely. 
Zimbardo explains the social deterioration of the prisoners as what's referred to sometimes in the literature as pathological prisoner syndrome. And this is a result of things like loss of personal identity. Remember, they were told to wear smocks and uh, they were called by their numbers and so forth. Living amongst strangers who don't know your name and your history, you dress like all the other prisoners. The prisoners became de-individuated and this is his key concept. De-individuation. This is or has been an explanation for why so few uh, Jews in Nazi Germany revolted um, even when they knew the likely fate. So, um, you know, there were only a handful of guards at uh, Auschwitz and, and concentration camps like that there were far more prisoners. So why didn't they all rise up? Why didn't they all, you know, fight the guards? Because actually, they've been weakened psychologically through this process of de-individuation. They had a number, a tattoo. They were all dressed the same. They had the head shaved, all that stuff. Okay, so Zimbardo further explains. De-individuation, I just want to show you this picture. Here's two prisoners wearing the same thing, sharing a cell. It looks kind of like a real prison. So, the arbitrary control exercised by the guards was interesting. Um, on post-experimental questionnaires, the prisoners said they disliked the way uh, that they were subjected to arbitrary and changeable decisions. Now, this is interesting. This is something that occurs often in dictatorships. Uh, Kim Jong-un, at the time of recording, has just executed one of his uh, one of his staff members um, by firing them out of an anti-aircraft gun because he fell asleep in a meeting. It is arbitrary, it is completely um, random. And this makes life unpredictable and unbearable and unfair. And actually, North Korea is a really good example. It's one of the the last uh, truly oppressive sort of 1984 dictatorships that exist since the uh, fall of Soviet Russia. And it is exactly like a macro version of this Stanford prison system, but much worse because there's death waiting for most or many at the end. As the environment becomes more predictable, the behaviours, uh, the prisoners show behaviours um, and signs of learned helplessness. This is a psychological concept. Learned helplessness is really uh, passivity. So you become a passive, you don't try to escape, you just, you just accept it. Um, there's some interesting animal studies actually that link to this. John Calhoun carried out research. Hold on, I'll just get out. So here's a picture. He created um, what they sometimes refer to as uh, mouse, mouse utopia or mouse topia. It was this massive environment in which uh, he seeded a small group of mice and wanted to see how populations uh, grew. Interestingly, when they become overpopulated, many of the mice, uh, sorry, the system become massively dominated by these incredibly aggressive predator mice who would, you know, murder and arbitrarily attack and and force reproduce with other mice. Anyway. For one group of, of mice, they just retreated to the corner and just shook. And this is an example in the animal kingdom of a similar process of learned helplessness. Anyway, that's John Calhoun. It's well worth looking at. I'm going to do a, a geek club on that at some point. So, dependency and emasculation. The prisoners were made to be totally dependent on the guards. They had to ask if they wanted to go to the toilet. Uh, before they lit a cigarette and all that sort of stuff. They wore these shapeless smocks and they wore no underwear and that makes you feel quite vulnerable um, and as a result they were again at the mercy of the guards. Afterwards some of the rationales for how, of how the selection process occurred was interesting. Uh, one group of prisoners, I see a few of them, said that one of the reasons why they were selected to be prisoners was that they were, quote, smaller than the guards. Now, actually, there was no difference in size, the average size between guards and prisoners, but they just perceived them as being bigger. 
Amazing. That's a psychological effect there. And it ha probably has some link to, you know, views of power and so forth. Okay, so Zimbardo says the study demonstrates the power of situational factors, influence behavior, things such as the power of uniform, the power of identity, identification, de-individuation, and all these other really important words. Um, there's about six or seven key words that if you throw into an essay, really will just pull out all the information you need to cover this. But this has huge implications as well, doesn't it, for how we run society, how we run prisons especially, but also perhaps schools. Okay, we're going to get into some proper evaluation, but before we do, uh, I'm going to introduce a new research methods concept here. So, so note this down um, in the margins on your guide notes. Demand characteristics. These are subtle uh, clues or cues that make participants aware of what the researcher expects to find or how the participant is supposed to behave. And this uh, little cartoon is quite a common one that you see describing this. What it means is that the, ex the participant basically works out what the experiment's about and changes their behavior as a result. Now this becomes a problem because then you're no longer observing um, objective behavior or behavior uninfluenced. You're actually part of the experiment and you're influencing it yourself. So think about, and we're going to get into this in a minute, how might demand characteristics have occurred in Zimbardo's experiment? Well, let's have a look at all the evaluations now. I've done these in PE format, but they're quite basic, so you probably need to flesh these out. You will need to flesh these out a little bit. One criticism of Zimbardo's uh, findings and some of the hoopla that, that appeared afterwards was that actually conformity to social roles is not automatic. If I give you a truncheon and a pair of dark glasses and a guard uniform, you're probably not going to storm into the sixth form common room and, and start whacking people over the head with it, uh, imposing order. That's not um, an automatic identification. In fact, not all the guards act in a sadistic way. The majority of the guards actually avoided sadistic behaviours. And these were considered good guards. Uh, and even occasionally did small favours for the inmates. This suggests that there's some re uh, free will involved. And actually, even though Zimbardo says it's not dispositional, it's situational. Actually, clearly, there's a huge dispositional element. Disposition, remember, is personality. So yeah, maybe if you're slightly more sadistic and then you get hired for this role, that's what makes the difference. Demand characteristics then. So this is what I primed in you before. Um, the same with Ash. There's lots of people that think that the participants really worked out what the experiment was about. They just played their game. They played their uh, role. Not quite compliance, probably not. You know, they're really trying to get into it, but like a good role play. So, uh, Banu, Zizi and Moveheady showed the Stanford Prison experiment to a large sample of students. They'd never heard of it before. The vast majority guessed the purpose of the experiment. As soon as you've been placed in that situation, it's quite easy to work out. And in fact, there was a BBC um, replica, replication of this study. It's not quite a perfect replication, but it was done for television, partially. And it was really obvious in the first few hours of being incarcerated, prisoners were talking about things like Animal Farm, the Soviet Union. They knew what the experiment, or some of them knew, what the experimenters were actually looking for. Uh, even though they hadn't any familiarity with Zimbardo. This suggests that the study may lack internal validity. Remember, internal validity is 
is the researcher looking at what they think they're looking at? So Bardo thinks he's looking at real behavior. He's actually just looking at uh, role play. Okay, demand characteristics. Get your head around that. We're going to keep coming back to demand characteristics in almost all um, social influence research. This is a biggie for all uh, social influence, but especially for Zimbardo. It was a colleague in the corridor who just innocuously asked uh, Zimbardo how things were going. Zimbardo told him about the experiment and he suddenly clicked. And this colleague implored Zimbardo to shut it down. Um, Zimbardo had got ethical um, approval from the university committee. However, I don't think he really acknowledged himself um, how drastic things were getting. And had it continued, the psychological abuse, there was a rule, no, no violence, you couldn't hit the prisoners. But the psychological abuse suffered by some prisoners could have been substantial. Interestingly, in the BBC version, which we'll uh, look at in a bit, um, a bit into the course, the prisoners eventually actually take over the prison. And we'll talk about why that is later. Real world implications. This applies to so many examples. I talked about de-individuation uh, with the Jews in Nazi Germany. Um, we could talk about Abu Ghraib, uh, Ghraib um, which was an Iraqi prison set up by the US. And the US ran it. And in the early 2000s, the scandal broke that they'd been abusing the prisoners. They'd been humiliating them, torturing them to some extent um, uh, in, in the most horrific ways. These were ordinary people. The American army, a lot of the, a lot of the soldiers in there are doing it to get a discount off of their university fees. They're not sadists. They're not even people who particularly like war. Well, no one likes war, but they're not even there to fight, really. They're just ordinary people. And yet, you put them in this situation with a few potentially um, dispositional characters and their behaviour changes. But there are many other examples of this as well. Uh, the abuse of old people in nursing homes, uh, child abuse in orphanages, all stacks up to, to the same processes. Okay, so that's all the content you need to know about um, Zimbardo, along with your guide notes and all the detail that's in there. So I'm giving the content and the overview, but the detail's really in there, which you've, you've read already. Now I'm going to give you the exam questions that we're going to go through in class. So you need to have written answers to all of these questions. Question one. Um, briefly describe... So question one is an A01 question. Only two marks available for this one, so think carefully about how much content you want to include. Describe what is meant by the term de-individuation. I would say around 40 to 50 words would be appropriate. Remember, bring the answer next time. Let's look at question two. This one is an AO2 style question. I'll read it out. Mike successfully applied for a job at Liverpool's football stadium. He was told that the, his job was to ensure that people were safe during the game. On his first day at work, he was told he would be stewarding uh, the supporters at the cop end of the ground. He was given a bright yellow high visibility jacket and because it was a sunny day, he wore his aviators. Five minutes into the game, a young boy stood up and cheered. Uh, Mike stormed into the crowd and gave the boy a serious telling off. Even if the boy shuffled uh, in his seat, Mike told him off. After half an hour of continually being told off, the boy burst into tears. He told Mike he wanted to leave at half time, but Mike said he wouldn't be allowed to leave. The boy spent the second half of the game staring into at the ground, avoiding eye contact with Mike. Explain Mike's behaviour 
and the boys' behaviour in terms of conformity to social roles. Six marks. So here you should be aiming for something just over half a page. The first thing to do is go through and pick out the really important information. Um, and then once you've done that, pair it up with what you know about Zimbardo's study and make those links. And bring the answer with you next time. Okay, let's have a look at question three. This is the type of question you're quite familiar with by now. Question three. Give one ethical and one methodological criticism of Zimbardo's study. So one ethical and one methodological. Now what you're going to find is often the ethical is going to be very similar to perhaps ones you've looked at before. Something to take into account um, if you've got a sort of stock answer that you can use for all these studies. For this one, four marks. So it's an evaluation question. So you need to use your PEE structure. And it's about two marks per PEE, per evaluation point. So you should be looking at two of those on a page. So that is all we have time for today. We've looked at Zimbardo's study, his aim, his method, his results. We've evaluated it. We looked a little bit about the historical context as well. And um, we've practiced some exam style questions. In the lesson, we're gonna have a little look at some videos uh, regarding Zimbardo's study. And there is a BBC uh, documentary style experiment um, on blend space that you can have a look at and at some point in geek club we'll find a time to watch one of the the many movies that have been made about this incredible experiment thank you very much for your time and i'll see you around what do you